Y'all, I'm, I'm excited to get to preach this message today. I was rescued one time. Uh, I was coming home from college my freshman year and got into a horrible car accident. And I was driving home after spring break, and I was very tired because we'd, I'd stayed awake a lot taking midterms at Hardin-Simmons. And when I was driving home, uh, I was eastbound on I-10 around the town of Kerrville. And when I was there, I began to weave off the road and fall asleep, and I did what they tell you never to do. I weaved off and then overcorrected. I woke up in the middle of going off the road. I overcorrected, and, and then I, the truck went, and it went back again, and then it started flipping all the way across the median. And, and I remember my CD player was playing um, Grease Lightning from the movie <laughs> Grease. And, and I had a really good CD player, and when I was flipping all the way across, I remember thinking, wow, my CD is not skipping at all. <laughs> and I'm flipping across the median, and I land upside down on I-10 West. And I'm there, and I'm terrified. I'm, I'm almost unconscious. And at that moment, I don't know how long it took, but I was there, and somebody came, and I heard his voice saying, are you okay? Let me help. And I felt his hand. I felt his hand grab me and begin to pull me out. I have no idea what his face looks like, but I, but I know what his voice sounds like, and I know what his hand felt like. We're going to talk in a moment about the one who, um, who restores and the one who saves and the one who rescues. That's the message, the one who rescues. I remember another time where I was kind of rescued in a, in a moment, but it was far less dramatic. I was playing football for Harden Simmons, and I was running down the field on a kickoff. And I'm running down, and, and I'm being double teamed, which is kind of common on kickoffs where, where I would uh, go. And I was being double teamed, and somebody else made the tackle, and the whistles blew, but these jerks continued to push me and, and harass me and, and keep pushing me, even though the whistles whistle blew. And so I had no choice. But after the whistle blew is to fight them back as hard as I could. And so I stopped and I was swinging. And another guy, as if two wasn't enough, another one from, from their team, I think it was Howard Payne University, ran up. And now I'm having to fight three yellow jackets and a good buddy of mine named Brad Langley runs over there and he just smashes into all of them. So now it's two on three for a second. The whistle's been blown for a good while. But after that, I, I the, the the, the, it's all done, and I look at Brad, and I say, thank you, bro, and Brad, Brad Langley came to rescue me in that moment. We go back to the sideline, and the coach benches both of us for a while, but man, I don't care. I'm grateful that in my moment, I, I had a guy who came to help me, and uh, I, I am. The, the sermon series that we're in is called The Journey of Light. And we are looking at this, I hope, so far that it's been a blessing to all of you and meaningful. I hope God is speaking to your heart, and I hope when he speaks to your heart that you are indeed listening to him. And in this series, we are looking at the major movements of God as he develops his big story so that we can trace the story of God and align ourselves with it. It is impossible to align ourselves and find identity in a story that we don't know. Amen? If you don't know it, then you can't align yourself with it. And there is the one rescuer in the entire story that reaches his hand down and he constantly takes his created people and, and gives them a new life. And, and I think that when people start to see that God has reached down, grabbed us, and brings us into his big story, it does start to give us identity and, and clarity in life and joy. Uh, Augustine, the church father, said this, that people are restless until they find rest in Jesus Christ, O Lord. And so far in tracing the story of God, we have looked at uh, uh, three different passages of scripture, three moments, and two of them were acts. And so act one, the curtain rose on creation in Genesis one and two. And then we looked at the second act, and that was the fall of man in Genesis three through 11. All of those passages talk about the fall. But then last week, guys, we kind of took a step back from all of the acts, and we looked at the covenants of God 
through which God is bringing salvation to our world. God brings salvation into this fallen world through the Abrahamic covenant that we talked about, through the number two, Mosaic covenant, and three, the Davidic covenant. And, and through these, we start to learn how God has, has reached down into our world and how he's rescuing it and saving our, our world and, and all of the acts. Today, we're looking at act three, and then next week, act four, and so on. But all of the rest of the acts fit very properly in the covenants of God. And these covenants find their, their culminating moment in the person of Jesus Christ, King Jesus who I love singing about, love singing about him with all of you. And so today the curtain rises and act three comes to uh, our church, the Israelites. The Israelites have found themselves in a moment of slavery in Egypt and God is going to rescue them and we are looking at the books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. And so as we look at this, Doug and Sue Holly are going to read the passage for us. And they're reading from the book of Exodus chapter 1. Doug and Sue, please come on out. And uh, y'all stand with Doug and Sue and turn with them to Exodus chapter 1, starting in verse 6. Exodus chapter 1, starting in verse 6. Now before they read, I, I want all of you to know Doug and Sue. I want y'all to know who they are because First Baptist Marble Falls would not be who we are without the faithfulness and the dedication of Doug and Sue Holly. Sue Holly worked in our office for years and worked with me there. Doug Holly has helped our church in every building program that we have had. Our, our pavilion was designed and built by Doug. Our mission center, he did for free for years doing all of this. And not just, not just all of that, but Doug and Sue love Jesus Christ with all of their heart. And, and I love them. I love them. And so I'm so honored for Doug and Sue to get to read from Exodus 1, um, verse 6 through verse 14. Thank you for all y'all have done, Brother Doug and Sue. Yeah, thank you, Jerry. And Joseph died, and all his brothers, and all that generation. But the sons of Israel were faithful, and increased greatly, and multiplied, and became exceedingly mighty, so that the land was filled with them. Now a new king arose over Egypt, who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of the sons of Israel are too many, and too mighty for us. Come, let's deal shrewdly with them, otherwise... They will multiply, and in the event of war, they will also join those who hate us and fight against us and depart from the land. So they appointed taskmasters over them to oppress them with hard labor, and they built for Pharaoh storage cities, Python and Ramesses. But the more they oppressed them, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread out so that they dreaded the sons of Israel. The Egyptians used violence to compel the sons of Israel to labor, and they made their lives bitter with hard labor and mortar and bricks and at all kinds of labor in the field, hmm. all their labors which they violently had them perform as slaves. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, through the hearing of your word today, we pray that you are glorified and that you are honored. Your word spoken and all of our hearts and all of our minds listening. In the name of Jesus Christ today, will you speak to every mind, God, and every heart? Father, will you help them to forget the stresses and anxieties that may have been brought in, that they may focus on you first, and then during the invitation, they're able to apply you to those stresses and anxieties. But Father, if our stresses and anxieties come first, then we will not be able to see or hear from you during this moment. So Lord, please speak to our hearts. Your servants are waiting and listening for something that's real and something that's helpful and good. And so may the Holy Spirit be the preacher today. And Lord, will you speak? We love you, Father. I thank you for everyone here. I confess and we confess that we're not all that we should be. 
And so, Lord, by your grace, will you forgive us and give us the ability to draw near to you on this wonderful Sabbath day. In Jesus' name that we pray, amen. Amen. God's people, the Israelites, are in Egypt and they're in slavery. How did they get there? Remember from last week, God promised that Abraham and his wife Sarah would be the beginning of this huge, huge, huge people group, and that people group would be formed into a nation and have a land of their own, and they would be the Israelites. And it was a crazy, crazy covenant, a crazy promise, because how can you be the, the, the beginning of a people group with millions of people? How can you do that if you can't even have one child? And how can you do it if you're too old to even have that one child? But somehow, despite how, how crazy it sounded, the Bible says that Abraham believed God. Would you, would you believe God? Would you have faith in God if he told you something that outlandish? Abraham did. He believed God. And based on that faith, God said, Abraham, you're a righteous man. He believed that that, that somehow God would, would give him all of that. And the amazing thing is that's not what they were praying for originally. When Abraham and Sarah first, before God spoke and made the promise, they were praying for children. But man, they weren't praying for a nation. They weren't praying for a people group. It, their prayer was probably like, Lord, when they first got married, Lord, give us, give us a lot of children. Years go by, the children don't come. And they lessen the prayer. Lord, just give us two children. Two would be nice, God. And now as they get ready to move out of uh, that, 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 that time when you're capable of having kids, now the prayer is, Lord, just one. Can you just give us one, Lord? And now they're decades past that moment. And God says, I'm going to fulfill all of it, and I'm going to give you an entire people group. And, and I just want to point something out here. There are lots of reasons for all of you to give your life to Jesus Christ. And this is just one of them. And it is the doctrine of small versus the doctrine of big. We often come to God and approach life with very small dreams and small kind of hopes. Like Abraham and Sarah, Lord, if you could just give us one kid, that, that would be enough. That's what we're hoping for. Lord, can you just give us something? God promises things that are way bigger. His covenant with us is bigger than what we can imagine. Um, God gave Abraham and Sarah an entire uh, nation, and all they were doing was praying for, for one, praying for a few. Think about the difference between what they were asking and hoping for versus what God gave to them. And, and God has not changed. This God still exists. This God is still found in the New Testament. This God is still found with us today. One scholar counted 750 promises that the Lord gives to us in the New Testament alone. And Jesus alludes to it in the Sermon on the Mount when, when Jesus said, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much what? More. How much more will your heavenly father give good gifts to those who ask him? You ask for this little amount. I intend to do something that you can't even conceive, something more. I, I'm just saying, y'all, people today desire life, love, and, and, and good things. Our constitution says that you have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But as we pursue happiness. And as we pursue life and freedom in these things, we do so by a lens that only we can conceive, only what we can imagine. God conceives more. God conceives bigger life, different freedom, a different kind and a bigger kind of happiness. In Jesus Christ, God promises a kind of life that is abundant and full and different we only pray and hope for what we can conceive, but the Lord conceives so much more, very much like the way that it was for Abraham and Sarah. And God's promise to them seemed incredibly far-fetched, but it happened. And not only was it far-fetched, it was almost laughable when God said, you're going to conceive and give birth to a son. The Bible says, Sarah, 
And Abraham just laughed and laughed about it. It was a joyous kind of laugh. But the word Isaac that they named their son means laughing. They laughed about all of it. And at the very beginning here in Exodus, we, we see how, how this group of people started growing and growing. And then God brought them to Egypt because there was a famine in the land where they were and they needed food. So they moved to Egypt and then here is what happens. The Hollies read the passage a moment ago. When they were in Egypt, after a long period of time, a Pharaoh rose to power who didn't know this family. And because he didn't know, he enslaved them and he oppressed them and he hurt them. And Abraham's family were called the Israelites because um, Abraham's grandson is named Jacob. And all of Jacob's life, the word Jacob means heel grabber, heel grabber, because he, he is twins with a, 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 his brother named Esau. But when Esau came out of the womb first, um, Jacob was holding on to his foot. And so his name, the name Jacob means holding the foot of his older brother. And all of his life, he had only chased after the dreams of Esau. He wanted Esau's blessing. He followed after Esau. All of Jacob's identity kind of came following after the things Esau had and what Esau deserved. God meets this guy Jacob in the wilderness. And, and in that moment, God says, I'm going to give you something. You're going to be important, not just your brother Esau. I'm going to give to you something that's just for you. And because of that, you're no longer going to be the foot grabber of your brother, Jacob. I'm going to give you a new name, meaning Israel. And now he became Israel. He had 12 sons. So his 12 sons would be the Israelites. The Israelites. The Israelites coming from the father, Israel. And so now that's where they come from. The people of Israel are now down in Egypt. And now they are put into bondage and slavery. And, um, and here is what the Bible says. It was read a moment ago. In verse 7, it says, While they were in Egypt, the Israelites were fruitful and multiplied greatly and became exceedingly numerous. Not just a little numerous, exceedingly numerous, so that the land was filled with them. God told Abraham, I'm going to make your descendants like the stars of the sky. Is God doing it here in Egypt? Yeah. And then in verse 12 of that same chapter 1, it was read a moment ago, it said, the more the Egyptians oppressed the Israelites, the more they multiplied and spread. That's crazy talk. The more they tried to hold them down and keep them down, the stronger that they became. God said that he would uh, uh, create this huge people group out of them. And he's doing it in chapter 12. The Bible says that just counting the Hebrew men was 600,000. And so some scholars think that if you add all of the wives and the children, it could have been about 2 million people. Man, 2 million out of, out of 2. Uh, the numbers are debated a little bit there. But regardless of the actual number of how many Jews, how many Israelites there were in slavery in Egypt, regardless, what the Bible is trying to say is God is fulfilling his promise to Abraham. He's making these people strong and he is building their population. And y'all, that is fascinating. Here is why it, it, it's fascinating to me. Because Pharaoh is doing everything he can to destroy the population to destroy it. In verse 12, I'll read it for you one more time. The more the Egyptians oppressed them, the more they multiplied. And, and right after that statement, we find this illustration about what the oppression of Moses looked, I mean, the oppression of Pharaoh looked like on the people. Here is how they were oppressed. It said that Pharaoh tried to kill all of the firstborn boys to try to keep the population down. Do y'all see? Here's what Scripture is trying to say. God makes a covenant with Abraham to grow their population. Pharaoh comes on the scene and tries to destroy their population. So who is against who? God against Pharaoh. 
Pharaoh and his Egyptian gods are coming against the God of the universe. In fact, uh, the whole first part of Exodus, with all the plagues and all of the things that, that are there, it is Yahweh God versus Pharaoh and all of the Egyptian gods. Pharaoh trying to hurt the population. God saying, no, 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 I'm going to build the population regardless of anything that you do, Pharaoh. So Pharaoh tries to destroy the population by killing the firstborn um, babies, the firstborn of all of these children. Y'all know how God saved them? He, he got all of the Hebrew women and inspired these women, the Hebrew women, to create a, a, a conspiracy. And the Hebrew women got together and, and here's what they did. It's, it's so neat. The Egyptians would send midwives and soldiers and officials whenever it was time for Hebrew women to have the baby. And they would send these midwives to get the baby and then immediately hand the baby over to the soldiers and the soldiers would take the babies out and kill them. And so the Hebrew women got together and they created a big conspiracy and they said, here's what we're going to do. We are going to induce labor on ourselves. We're going to induce labor. And we're going to have babies that are premature, premature babies. And we're going to have these premature babies, but we're going to then hide them, but then take really, really good care of them. And hopefully God is going to save all of our premature children. We're going to have the babies earlier so that when the midwives come and show up, there is no baby. We've already had the baby and um, we, we, they might lie and say that the babies were killed and so the, the, can you imagine all of these babies are living, but Pharaoh wants them dead. And I have imagined what the meetings are like when you get all of those Egyptian officials and the Egyptians who are supposed to be doing this in a room with Pharaoh. And, and Pharaoh looks at all of them and, 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 and he says, look, the Israelite population is bound to go down. It's bound to go down. At the least, the, the Israelite population should stay the same. Here's what should not be happening. For the Israelite population to get larger. No way. How is that happening? And, and, and he looks at all of these Egyptians and he says, y'all tell me. Give me an answer. And here's what they said. They said, look, the Hebrew women are different from the Egyptian women. The Hebrew women, and the word the Bible uses for them, the Hebrew women are vigorous women. They're super strong. The Hebrew women are different, man. We can't get to them in time. They induce labor, bring about premature children, hide them from us, and that's why the population continues to grow. I love it. If we had a men's ministry, we could call them the men of valor, and the women's ministry could be the women of vigor. What do you think? The vigorous ones. And I, can, I, I know that, that later generations and generations of Hebrew women who came after this, the moms would, would tell this story to them. We are the vigorous mothers, the strong mothers. And so a mom would have a little 10-year-old girl, and she's raising that little girl, and, and the little girl maybe falls and hurts her knee or, or she's crying and the Hebrew mama says, darling, let me tell you a story about where you come from. Our ancestors were vigorous and they were strong women. And when all of the Egyptians tried to kill our children, do you know what we did? We did this. And she described it and she said, and this, my child, is who you are. You're a part of this. And you too are a vigorous woman. And you're going to grow up and there's going to be a time in your life where you want to give up, give up faith and everything else. But you can't. You can't give it up because you come from a long line of the vigorous mamas of the Hebrew faith. That's why you can't. You're a part of all of this. This is how the Hebrews and the Israelites would tell it. And, and do you think that little girl, when she was told stories like that, do you think she started to see herself as a part of the story? And that's what we're doing. We are telling these stories so that we begin to see how we fit into the stories as well. That you are captured up into all of it. Now, God 
is moving and growing all of this despite tragedies and despite all of the difficulties and he's bringing about his will um, in the middle of all of the difficulties. But when I say that, I don't want y'all to hear something I did not say. When I say that God was working in the middle of slavery and oppression and all of these things, I did not say that God causes the suffering, okay? I didn't say God causes the suffering. God loves us. I didn't say God causes the death and all of these things. Sin, sin causes the suffering of our world. Sin causes death. In Romans chapter 5, it says death comes into our world because of sin. Not, not because God ordered it. Because of sin, God is working in the middle of it. He's fixing it. He's adjusting all of these things. But here's a neat part of this. God can take what sin and Satan and Pharaohs throw at our lives in order to break us and in order to hurt us. All the things that your Pharaohs in life might send to you and the sin that so oppresses us, all of that that comes at us, God takes all of it and somehow makes us stronger and helps us to grow. And then he's able to say to all of the evil forces who, were, who thought that they could destroy us and all of it, he could say, I took all that you did and I reversed it and I grew the people. I helped the people in the middle of all of it. And sometimes I, I wonder this. I, I, I wonder if as God grows all of us through difficult times and suffering, if each one of those times he does that, it not only helps our faith to be stronger in the end, but I wonder if it makes the devil, if it makes the devil wonder why he's even trying anymore. Where, like, like Pharaoh who, who oppressed and oppressed, and we're going to kill all the children. I'm going to kill them when they're older because I'm going to work them so hard they're going to die young. I don't let them grow old, and I'm going to kill them when they're young. Therefore, I'm going to annihilate the population of all of them. Like Pharaoh was not able to accomplish that, and God grows the population instead. The devil, with all of his harshness, and, and, and all of his violence and all of his sadness that he brings on God's good creation that he can. And then he thinks, this is bound to work. It is bound to work. And then he sits and he sulks with all of his demons. And he says, why isn't it working? Why? Why? How in the world, after 2,000 years of doing everything I can to hurt the church of Jesus Christ, everything I can, why is the church still here? How is it that, that, that it's even grown? And this is not just happening, you know, everywhere in the world, but right here. But in the world, too. He, he brings this, this oppression on the churches in communist China where they're only able to meet underground, but we get reports from the underground church that the church is exploding in China and in Africa and in Asia, in the Middle East, that they're experiencing revivals in places like Iran. I can just see the devil like Pharaoh sitting saying, how is this possible? I've done everything. I've done everything to kill it, and yet it's growing. And at that moment, this is how the devil is just like, God is so much bigger. God is doing so much more here in our church, and even in this day and time, we're getting reports from churches all over the nation that are having record numbers of students go to camp. More kids surrendering to ministry. People being baptized all over. I had a report from Megan's brother Josh and, and his wife um, Haley have a house church that they're in in Poteet. And Haley's dad is a, is a pastor of a church in Pleasanton, Texas, a real small church. They had their vacation Bible school. And on the Wednesday night of, of, of VBS, Clyde, the pastor, got, got up and he shared simply a plan of salvation and they videoed it. I videoed it and sent it out parents so that parents could watch it. He is giving a gospel message about Jesus to children at the Vacation Bible School. And there was a dad who watched that online and gave his life to Jesus Christ. Watching a Vacation Bible School online. And the devil is thinking, I have oppressed him. I have done all these things. I've tried to convince the church that it is a post-Christian era. 
and that, 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 that people are, dec- the church is declining everywhere. How is it that somebody gives their life to Jesus Christ watching a children's vacation Bible school online? How is it that more kids continue to come and surrender? Here is the reason. Because the same God who is the great I am that spoke to Moses at Mount Sinai and said, I am is sending you, is the one who is still alive and growing the church today. The great I am is moving. And here is where this next part is kind of revealed. And we're almost finished with the sermon, y'all. Hang on. This next step is, is where this large people group are now formed into a nation, and a nation has to have a constitution and has to have laws and a governing kind of way about it. If it's ever going to have staying power, if it's ever going to be a family that stays until, they're, until God is ready to send the Messiah, Jesus Christ, through this family, they got to stick around. They, they, they can't just um, say, oh, God brought us out of Egypt, and they all spread out. They have to stay together and be a family if God's going to bring Jesus through that family. How do you keep a group of people together? You organize them. You, 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 you give them a government. You give them a constitution and a group of laws, and that's what will do it. So God raises up this guy Moses. He saves him from the, um, the vigorous mamas of uh, the Israelites, and he is saved I think it's amazing crocodiles didn't eat him when he was floating in the Nile. And, and they save him and God calls him to go down and lead the people back to the land that Abraham gave them. And he speaks to him in this burning bush moment in a mountain that, that's called Sinai. And, 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 and I picture that. And my mind always goes to Cecil B. DeMille's old movie, The Ten Commandments. Do you remember that? Ah, y'all want to watch it? That moment? Let's see it. here. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place where I now stand is holy ground. I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Lord, Lord, why do you not hear the cries of their children in the bondage of Egypt? I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Therefore I will send thee, Moses, unto that thou mayest bring my people out of Egypt. Who am I, Lord, that you should send me? How can I lead this people out of bondage? What words can I speak that they will heed? I will teach thee what thou wilt say. When thou hast brought forth the people, they shall serve me upon this mountain. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. Now therefore go, and I will be with thee. But if I say to your children that the God of their fathers has sent me, they will ask what is his name, and how shall I answer them? And the I am did. 
And the I am brought them out. And, and he took them to that mountain right there, and he started to form them, not just from a family, but, but into a nation so that they can have staying power. If they were going to last, he gives them the law, and he, and he, and he gives them a government. He organizes them. See, no, no organization can make it unless they have a governing kind of constitution on which they agree on, a, a, a set of laws that kind of binds them together. You can only make it, if you want to create a business, if you want to create a fraternity, anything you want to create, eventually, if it's going to stay, it has to have organization to it. If a civilization is going to make it any amount of time, it has to have this civility, this civil, where we get civil laws from, civilization. And so he begins to work them into a civilization that has laws and a government so that they can have staying power. And, and it's the same with any organization. The, the, the same God that organized them and gave them these things. This is what he did later on in the New Testament too. The day of Pentecost, he begins to organize them on himself. They begin to learn and, and, and learn the doctrines and the theology of the Lord. He organizes them based on all that. It's why it, it just cracks me up when I hear somebody say, oh, I don't believe in organized religion. I, I don't believe and, and I don't like the church because I don't believe in the organized church. And I want to say it's what God has been doing. It's not as if we just come and, and, and think, oh, we're going to do whatever we, we want. God speaks and he organizes us into something. And I say, man, the organizing, the giving, the governmenting that, that he does with people is important if we're ever going to stay. Our church has been here since 1888 because a long, long, long time ago they created a set of bylaws which demonstrated our deepest held beliefs in the gospel of Jesus Christ and every pastor who has ever been, ever been here preaches those beliefs. It, it, it is the, 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 the governing the organizing around those beliefs. And I say it's not a bad thing. It is a great thing. And then I add to this. And by the way, when you say that you don't like churches that, that, that are organized, we are organized, but we ain't that organized. I mean, we, golly, just come and be a part of us and you'll know. There's a lot of chaos that happens around here. We're organized, but not that much. Not as much as it will offend you. You'd be very, very welcome in all of that. So the, 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 the law of the Lord forms them into a people group who are able to stay through the centuries so that they can be there and have Jesus Christ, through, so that the Messiah can be born with them. He gives them the, the law to hold them together. The second reason he gives them the law on top of staying power is that the law taught them how horrible and prolific in deep sin really was. And it helped them at some very small level to mitigate sin, to keep it a little bit at a distance, and to fight against it. To fight against the moments where you want to kill somebody out of your anger. To fight against lustful moments when you feel like having an affair. To fight against things that, that make you want to worship another God besides God. Fight against it. And the law did not fix sin at all. In fact, the law made sin more understandable. It, it, it made sin clearly seen. And, it, and, and when they saw it clearly, it broke their hearts ever so much more. And so they would cry out to God, now that we have a law, we're able to see how bad sin is. Lord, what do we do about it? And God said, you're going to have to sacrifice animals because you need to see that sin brings death and the sacrificial system starts and, and just they become such a bloody people in this. Lord, here's my very best cow and here's my very best sheep and here's my very best Lord and they, they bleed it all out over the altars in the sacrificial system. The law didn't fix sin, the law highlighted sin, and the law showed them how much they needed to be saved. And the law set them up 
for centuries. It, se- it sets them up so that one day a Messiah will come and be the sacrificial lamb to end all sacrifices. And he would take all the sin of the world upon himself. And he's the one who would fix sin. The law doesn't fix it. The law highlights it, keeps the people together. But Jesus Christ who will come is the one who would eliminate sin and conquer it and conquer all of death. And so the Mosaic Covenant was different than the Abrahamic covenant. Now it says, if you will obey this, I will bless you. And, and by obeying it, you're going to be a holy people, which means set apart. I'm going to make you different from all the other pagan people, and I'm going to make you very, very unique, um, uh, unique as a nation. And the book of Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy all talk about the sacrificial system and, and all the things that they are to do. And, and a lot of it's just normal way of life. Here's what to do if mildew is found in your tent. Um, here's how to take care of women and, and children right after they are born. And here's what a, a proper godly sexuality looks like. And, and, and all of these things, they, they begin to come together and how you celebrate God. The Mosaic Covenant brought them together and all of it and, then it, and it, and it hammered them during the 40 years in the wilderness and going into the promised land. And through all of that, they're like, Lord, we've messed up over and over again, but Yahweh, the great I am, does something unique for them. He shows up over and over and he gives them shoes that won't wear out and he gives them water from a rock, and he gives them manna, and he gives them quail, and his presence is with them in a a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. God will not leave them. He is the I am who is with you in all of these things. And they started to see themselves in God's work. Do you see yourself in God's work? Do Do you order your life in accordance with it, so that you become holy, so that you become different in accordance with him. And they remembered it. And so way, way, way later, um, every single year they created the Passover to remember this moment. And the children would come and they would ask the parents, why do we eat bitter herbs on this night? Why do we talk about slavery on this night? And then the parents would say, we're going to take the Passover because God sacrificed the lamb to get us all out of Egypt. And so this is why this night is special. And for hundreds of years and even today, the Jewish people still celebrate the Passover. But about 2,000 years ago, there was a rabbi from Nazareth and he sat down with his apostles to celebrate the Passover that talked about how God um, saved them out of slavery and out of Egypt, and he sat down with all of them, and somebody there said, you know, Lord, why do we take the bitter herbs? Why do we do it like this? And Jesus was leading out in that discussion, and he got to the moment of the bread, and then he did something that no Jewish rabbi and no father in uh, the house ever, ever did. Jesus took the bread at that Passover moment, and he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And I want you to remember it the same way that you've remembered all of these things. Now I want you to break it and I want you to remember me. God was going to send his son, Jesus Christ, into the world to be the Messiah, but he needed a family of faith in order to do it. This is their story. And you are a part of it. And we take the Lord's Supper because we remember what Jesus did. And we remember his long, long lineage of this family. And you're a part of it all. I hope you are. Do you want to be? Y'all want to be a part of it? Youth, do you want to be a part of it? This is the story. Will you bow your heads with me as we close?